Hello, I'm Jonathan Bowman Perks and welcome back to my favourite time of the week. Uh, and in the Inspiring Leadership series, I'm very honoured to have an old friend of mine, Colonel Tim Collins. And um, if you uh, look on Wikipedia, you'll see what a hell of a story and a life Tim has had already and there's more to be done. Um, so, very successful career with the Royal Irish and tours with the SAS. And uh, we were together at, at Staff College and he was very famous for uh, his speech that he wrote on the eve of, the, of going into Iraq, which I still keep a copy of and, and found personally very inspiring and so did clearly the President of America because he put it on his wall. Um, Tim then, after the army, went into, into business and is very successful taking the best and the brightest who have just left the armed forces and helping them help countries around the world who need great advisors and great um, great people with subject matter experts. So, real pleasure to have you here, Tim. Uh, Tim, I think the, the first thing I'm interested to hear is, is sort of your experience of inspiring leaders. Who, who, would, who would you put up and, and what qualities are, are it that would be useful for the execs who are listening? Well, for the executives, I mean, really, uh, inspiring leaders at the highest level, uh, I, I must say I've been more impressed with American generals than I have um, with British generals, uh, but then that's sort of being in the proximity. But the people who have inspired me along the way, really, as a young officer, were uh, there's commanding officers who, uh, my first commanding officer in the SAS, um, uh, General, uh, now General Cedric Dells, um, who uh, retired, written a great book recently, but he, he was a huge inspiration, a man of few words, deep intellect, but a, a great leader who made the young officers in the SAS at the time want to please him and yeah. emulate him. Um, at the same time, there was uh, then Rupert Pritchard, who was my commanding officer when I was operations officer at 2-2 SAS, who is the, still the man I look to, has the most unfailing moral compass. He's the man you can guarantee to do the right thing. He would be the man who would have told politicians, no, we can't, no, we won't. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and his, uh, the example he set for me uh, is something I tried to emulate of doing the right thing and asking yourself is, and having the courage to say no, or the courage to stick your hand up when it's unpopular, and yeah. you discover other people are thinking that too, but Rupert Pritchard gave me that, and, and then I worked um, luckily with uh, General John Allen, who went on to command ISAF, and John Allen has a, is a fierce Marine, but he has, uh, he's a gentleman and uh, hugely inspir inspirational, and one of the things that he really, you know, we, we used to fall over ourselves to please him, because he was such a gentleman, such a great leader, and the, and the biggest sanction he could ever, he did shout out on, on occasion, but he just looked disappointed with you, which would crush you. We just wanted to please him. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and we were talking before about all the, all the fine leaders I've met have learned from their own mistakes, and, and if someone says to me, now oh, I've never made a mistake, that, that's a problem in itself. And you and I were talking about psychopaths earlier that we'd come across, we might come up and cover that in a minute. But, um, when you think about your own mistakes that you've made, uh, what, what sort of story would you share with people of, of the mistakes that you've made and what you've learned from them? The mistakes I, I've made really have been uh, failing to see in others failure and convincing myself that things will be fine and not stepping in. And the realization that sometimes an individual failing, they're not just failing you, they're failing everyone around. And uh, my instinct is always to give people a, another chance or to help them out or, or wait and see how it turns out. And sometimes you've got to wait in there. And, and, and be, uh, being too trusting uh, in any given individual is a failure in itself because sometimes people have good days and bad days. And ultimately, be, um, and, and failing to ignore the little signs which are there along the way of disloyalty, dishonesty, um, or in, uh, inadequacy. Um, yeah. Sometimes you've got to spot those and consider them and confront them. And that's the whole thing, you've got to confront them and, and stop it. Yeah, and, and in business, how have you found you, you're now more savvy about it? <coughs> well, in business, again, it's, it's very much taking, um, not being overly trusting. Right. Um, people will take advantage of that. Um, you'd, be, you'd probably not be amazed how many times it's in business that I've, um, Followed false prophets who have promised work, and, and you invest a lot of time and effort and money in these individuals, and you turn out it turns out that they've they have no access whatsoever. In fact, they're using you to get access, and it's it's having that the instinct to spot those failures early on, and lead your team away from those blind yeah. alleys. That that's the 
um, where you need to constantly ask yourself, is, is what I'm seeing is what it is? Yeah, and that, that famous story of the two salesmen and one comes in and said, I had some great meetings today. The other guy said, yeah, I didn't sell anything either. <laughs> And um, we're going to share it at the, at the end, and then maybe we can, uh, if we've got a little moment, we might talk about psychopaths. But, but your top tip for the execs who are listening, what, what would you give as a sort of top tip about being a really good leader? What, what, you had about three or four things that you said were really useful. Well, I mean, the, the, cru the crucial thing in any organization, particularly vocational organizations, that marks you out as a leader uh, above all else, is, is knowing what needs to be done. And you've constantly got to... to, to Look at what, what, what you're there to do and what the organization does and, and refine and refine in your head. Look at others mm -hmm. and, and get very crystal clear direction as to what you're there, what the purpose of the organization or the, the company is. And once you know that, then the trick is to tell other people what it is and to keep them. And when you do that, then you build your organization around the purpose. And you, you might need another department. You might be able to merge departments and once you've got the structure right, then you get the right people into the organization. And that's about finding the best talent you can afford. Mm. And once they're in there, tell them what the, the purpose is. Just help them understand what, why you've got the structure as it is. They might see it differently and might advise you differently. Um, and you get the spirit of ownership of those people. They care about what, what it is they do from day to day. They're thinking about when they're lying in bed or in the band mm. as well as you are. And once you've got the right spirit into your people, then getting your instructions to people right day to day is crucial. That's communication two-way. You're telling them in one respect and, and, and what you're hearing from other departments, but they're feeding back to you what the customers are saying and what they're seeing out there. And that collectively gives you the ability to, to, to make things work. And having got the, figured out what you're for, got the structure right, got the spirit in people, and you're communicating well with your people, the, the fifth step really, I guess the crucial thing is let them get on with it. Yeah, Sometimes you've got to just it. step back and let people get on with it. That's not, you know, and ultimately the acme of success in business is to tell people what it is, get the structure right, surround yourself with those really talented people and let them get on with it. And when the organization succeeds, you take all the credit. Yeah, <laughs> we had a good laugh at that. Now, uh, I think I'm just looking at tell you, we've got a, a chance for a, a final minute. Um, you, you are fascinating on the story of the, what I call the white collar psychopath. And we can't change them, but we have to learn to be quite resilient and cope with them, or leave the organisation they're in, or get rid of them. But what would be your, in the last minute, your final tip about how to, how to spot and handle the, the white collar psychopath? Well, I mean, they're easy to spot because they tend to be bullies. Um, the trick is to, to uh, ultimately, if you can, is find them things to do where they don't have to interact with any carbon-based life forms or other humans. <laughs> um, so try and separate them out from the people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not to be employed with troops or newts as they're known. Uh, yeah. And what you need to do is fi find them distractions that uh, keep them busy and yeah. elsewhere. And you can do that through flattery. You can do it with pretty girls or pretty boys, whatever it is, but get them away from the people <laughs> and protect your people from them. And the most important thing you can do is protect your people from them because by doing that, the people will serve you well, will serve the company well, will even serve the psychopath well, and peace and harmony will reign. Tim, thanks. As always, a great pleasure. You've had an amazing career so far. Thank you very much for sure. sharing your story, and I wish you every success. Thanks. Thanks.